Okay, get settled down now, please. Could you shut the door, please? Hello? Hello, could you shut the door, please? Well, yes again, stand in remotely. Okay, uh, good to see so many of you here. Um, I hope you've all now had the opportunity to um, at least uh, form uh, the Ugly Deaky textbook. Um, there are, as I mentioned last week, there are some copies of that in the library, but clearly there's nowhere near enough copies of that for, you, uh, for all of you to go around. Um, I've uploaded some information on here. Have you all seen the announcements that I've been posting? Yeah, um, I was thinking about sending you email. Um, when, I, when I post an announcement on here, I have an option to basically email the announcement to you. Um, but I am mindful of the fact that you guys get bombarded with emails, don't you? Um, so I kind of work on the basis that um, you should be checking this anyway, rather than me clogging up your email inboxes with other announcements as well. So, um, well done to those of you that have seen these announcements. If you've not seen the announcements, it's because you've not checked Blackboard. So get into the habit of checking it regularly, rather than me having to kind of with emails and stuff. Um, there's um, some information that I've put up on here that hopefully you will find um, of use. The first um, is this link here. There's an online OU course. Um, it's free. Um, and it should only take you about two hours. How many of you have actually looked at this yet? Oh, crikey. Three or two or three of you. Right, do it. It's really, really useful, okay? I guarantee you, here you go, let's talk, let's talk uh, business. I guarantee you, if you look at that, you'll get a higher grade. That's what we're all in business are doing, isn't it? Getting higher grades. Look at that, read it, do it, and you'll get a higher grade. There you go, simple as that. It's really, really interesting. Um, it's an online course. You all like sitting in your computer. It's only you can do it on your phone as well, I'm sure. Um, an online course. I'll quickly open it, look. Um, this is the, um, the Word document of the, of the course. It should only take you two hours, and it's really, really good. But here you go, here it is. You can actually download this by clicking on here and go on to the internet version of it. But I've downloaded this as a PDF. Um, and this provides some really useful information which provides an overview of some of the things that we're looking at today, okay? Um, so that's there to help you. Um, so if you've not looked at this, this yet, then please do so. It will increase your grade, okay? And that's what we're in the business of doing, getting high grades. Um, I work on the basis that I don't mention anything unless I think it's gonna help you, okay? I don't wanna overburden you. Um, I remember a few years ago when I was teaching a similar module to this, um, I had for each week four different readings uh, for you guys to look at each week. It became apparent that none of you were reading it, so I've only given you one reading to do, okay? So that is the bare, bare minimum that you should be doing, okay? So you should have all read the first chapter of Ugly Deaky for today's session. Everyone in this bit where you all put your hands up, who of you have done that? Who of you have read the first? Brilliant, excellent. Today's lecture, guys, you guys that have got your hands up, put your hands up again. Okay, you might as well go home because it's going to be so simple to you that you're going to be like, okay, this is like, I mean, state the obvious. You've done yourself a huge favour by doing that reading in advance. The stuff that I'm going to tell you today, you're going to be like, yeah, I knew that already. It's like, yeah, that's a big deal. Okay, so do reading beforehand and it will really help you. So that's good that you've done that. Well done. Okay, the um, other thing that I've put on here uh, for you to have a look at is this article here uh, by Jock Young called Thinking Seriously About Crime. In today's seminar, we're going to be talking about voluntarism and determinism. I'm going to mention these concepts in a moment. Um, now, um, this is a really useful online resource. Again, I'll open this for you just so you can see it. How many of you have looked at this? I said, Let, let's do that again. Let's do that again. Rather than the two or three people that had a liar to me and say you've all done it. Hands up. Uh, some two or three people. Okay, yeah. um, look at this, it's really useful. Okay, um, there's lots of um, information in here that you won't necessarily be referring to on this, uh, on this particular module, um, but it does provide a very useful overview of orthodox criminology. He talks about classicism and positivism, and he does it in a really simple way where he breaks it down into different concepts. So just quickly look at one. Okay, so he's looking at six paradigms. The first is classicism. And what he does is he breaks down each of these um, theories into a very easy to understand sections. So what does classicism say about human nature? 
What does it say about social order? What does it say about definition of crime? And it does that for positivism as well. So you need to read this stuff um, because it will help you understand what all the information we're about to go on to look at is a critique of. Okay, so and you have covered this. You know, I told you um, some of this last year in my seminar groups for chronological imagination. Um, so um, you did cover this. I know you covered this with David last year, but you need to refresh your memories. We don't have time to go through all this um, again in great detail, though I'm going to go over some of it in a moment just to refresh your memories in addition to what we did last week. So have a look at this as well. So you're only looking at the pages that I flagged up in my announcements, okay? Um, and my announcements. Obviously, on the announcements page. Um, there's also some other information there from Andy about the um, Amsterdam trip. If you've not seen, that's Posey. That's my little puppy. Isn't she cute? Yeah. Super cute. Yeah. Okay. You'll be seeing more of her as the uh, as the course uh, progresses, whether or not you like it or not. Okay. Right. So um, the, the the reason Posey's making an appearance is to try to encourage you guys to quickly access this stuff. Okay, because it's important. Right, okay, so um, you've only been here five minutes, I've already given you loads of extra stuff to do. Um, it looks like none of you have done it, or only a few of you have done it. Those of you that have done it, brilliant, um, you're the ones that are going to do exceptionally well. There's uh, a direct correlation between those that do the reading I suggest and those that do well, that won't surprise you. Um, so do the reading, okay, the stuff I'm giving you is pretty straightforward. Um, so um, there's no, there shouldn't be really any excuses for not looking at that information. Okay, right. So um, today, um, just going to bring this up. Today, in today's lecture, we just quickly open the module handbook. I'm not going to do this every week. I'm just doing this so everyone's kind of up to up to, up to speed in terms of where we're at and where we're going with this. This is the outline, okay, of everything that we're doing each week. So this week. What is so radical about radical criminology? And it's based upon chapter one, and in today's seminar, this is what we're going to be looking at. The two question uh, posed by Ugly DP um, in um, that very first chapter, okay, so page 35. Next week, we're looking at symbolic interactionism, so on and so forth. Okay, so that's where we are, that's where we are, well, that's where we are at with that. Okay, now, right, what I'm trying to do over here, if I go over here, so I'm trying to recall the whiteboard using my shiny brand new, very posh laptop. Um, so we'll see how this goes. I'm hoping it's going to record what I've got on this board here so you can go back to this. Okay, so we'll see how we get on with this. Hopefully it will work. Um, let's have a look. Okay, right. So I'm going to be referring to the information that's on this board here, okay? So this is where your eyes need to be right now. Okay, this week we're looking at what is so radical about radical criminology. Now, in last week's lecture, I said to you that I'm going to ask you a question right at the very beginning of this session, um, which kind of outlined the two key um, aspects of what radical criminology was. Right, let's see who is paying attention. What are the two key components of a radical approach? I asked you to write it down in your book. I said, I will be asking you this. Are you going to tell me? Um, yes? Um, the two key components, yeah. Um, Everything that the two things that the whole module centers around. Can you remember what it was? Um, Who said that? You are a genius. Stand up so everyone can see you. Just stand up. Okay, you are a genius anyway. Um, right, so first concept, power relations. Good. I'm going to go into these in a bit more detail, but let's just kind of um, get you thinking and talking. What was the other key concept? Brilliant geniuses. Okay, right. If you know what, if, if you weren't going to answer that question, I was literally going to launch myself off the stage. Um, right, this is good stuff. Okay, right, so you remembered from last week then that I said that what makes um, radical criminology is it focuses upon the twin concept of power relations and inequality. And I said to you that the radical approach isn't really, um, there's no set definition. We're going to go on to look at this in, in 
they let them think what these are. But let me just tell you where we're going to go today so you know where this lecture is going to go in, 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 so you can kind of um, sort of follow the different stages. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to give you another very brief overview of classicism and positivism, okay? Because that is orthodox criminology, and radical criminology provides a critique of that. We need to be clear of what the old criminology was, if you like, or what these orthodox or establishment criminologies were. Um, and then we're going to go on to look at radical criminology as a contested term. And you'll see that it's an umbrella term, that it's a kind of a casual category. How many of you, when you've been doing your reading, have been getting a bit confused in here? Hold on a minute. One minute we're talking about radical criminology, and one minute we're talking about critical criminology. Has anybody picked up on that yet? Indeed, the, the, the textbook that I've recommended is called Critical Criminology. Well, the terms radical criminology and critical criminology get used interchangeably, okay? And they're both what we call umbrella terms. So it, it, they're kind of terms that incorporate a range of different ideas, and these are the two concepts that unify those ideas. So most of the ideas that we're going to be looking at will centre around concepts of power relations and inequality. Now last week um, we said that inequality can manifest itself in a variety of different ways. What are the, the, the kind of levels that we looked at last week very briefly? How does inequality manifest itself? What are the different categories of inequality, if you like? Anyone remember? Let's look at um, you and so she and him. Okay, gender. Okay, gender. So inequality can manifest itself through gender. How else? What other categories of inequality might there be? Race and class. Race, brilliant. Class is another big one, isn't it? Age, ability or disability. So there's a whole variety of categories of inequality. And so I think we're going to go on to look at feminist criminologies that focus on gender inequality. Okay, right, so we've got these twin concepts then that lay at the heart of the radical enterprise. That much we're pretty clear about. Right, now, I said to you that, classic, uh, that radical criminology is an is, is, um, has an overt um, uh, kind of a, a commitment to critique. Okay, critique is at the centre. Okay, critique is at the centre of radical criminology. So critique of what? Well, generally speaking, um, these radical forms of criminology provide a critique of what we call orthodox. Orthodox criminology. Okay, orthodox criminology. And that then begs the question, well, what is orthodox criminology? Well, we looked at this briefly last week, and we said that orthodox criminolo uh, criminology really can be split into two strands. On one hand, we have classicism, and on the other hand, we have positivism. Okay? We said that positivism itself can be split into two categories. So we've got here individual positivism, and then we have here sociological positivism, different strands of positivism. Okay? So this is what we mean by orthodox criminology. Now, those of you that have done some reading on this, you will be asking yourself the question, well, he's telling me it's orthodox criminology, but I don't know why it's orthodox criminology. So let me explain to you why. What makes this orthodox criminology? What does it mean to be orthodox then? Well, I'm going to explain this to you. Okay, so let's take classicism to start with. You covered this uh, last year. This is one of the oldest frameworks of understanding. And very, very simply, it's based upon the, upon the premise that people, when they commit crime, simply make a choice. Okay? That criminality is a simple choice. So I have, I am endowed, according to the classicists, with reason. Okay, rationality. As a free will, rational creature, I have the ability to make choices. So here's an action. So here I am, there's me there. Okay, action. My action, according to classicists, is based upon what's called hedonism. Hedonism. So there I am there. Okay, action, like hedonism. I'm just going to put a H up here. What is hedonism? Anybody know what hedonism is? 
Exactly, well done. Okay, hedonism means that as an individual, it's an assumption that the cast is made. As an individual, I value pleasure and I want to avoid pain. Okay, that's hedonism. That we organise our lives in such a way that we want to pursue pleasure and avoid pain. That's how we make our choices. Okay, so I've got this very worried looking student in front of me, and she's probably thinking, Why has he got my phone? Well, I've got your phone, so I'm going to demonstrate um, what the class is to say. So there I am, there's me, and I have the ability to make choices. So here's my action. So when I make when I form a decision according to the classicist, I have the ability to make a choice. So according to these, I value pleasure, but I want to avoid pain. Okay, right, here we go then. So my action, I've taken this phone. Right, I want to increase my pleasure, but I want to avoid pain. This is how I'm going to make a free will rational decision. So what's the potential pleasure of me taking this phone? I get a new phone. It's actually a bigger phone than my phone, actually. Right, it's a bigger phone than my phone. It's a bit rubbish, it's chipped at the bottom here. So, if you could get this fixed next week, that would be good. It's a bigger phone, I will have an additional phone. So, I can get all my girlfriends to bring me on my additional phone. So, I can all get my phone. this phone. So, that's the potential pleasure, isn't it? Okay. What's the potential pain? What's the potential pain? I get caught. Well, I think there's a few, uh, few witnesses in the room, isn't there? There's lots of pieces of witnesses, right? Well, what are you going to do, ultimately? What? You're going to report it? Well, okay, you're going to report it to who? The police, okay, and the police will say, well, you've committed an act of theft, um, so I could be potentially prosecuted. You might tell my boss. Um, I think he gets this every year, so he uses his example every year, so he's doing his face, and like, he's doing that for anything. I could potentially get a sack. Now, as a free will, rational creature, where I'm endowed with the ability to make choices, am I going to take this phone? No. So I'm going to hand it back. Right, so, what does that tell us about crime then? What that tells us about crime is that individuals who, make, who commit crime are actually, actually acting irrationally. Because no rational creature would commit a crime knowing that the consequences outweigh the potential benefits. Making sense? Right, so, endowed with the ability to make choices and um, your actions are guided by reason. Now, these guys, the classicists, okay, um, their ideas were underpinned by something called the Enlightenment, okay? Well, we'll come back to the Enlightenment later on. Okay, right, so that's sort of making some sense over here. Right, this is just a very quick introduction of what it is that they do before we go on to explain what makes them orthodox. So it's really important we understand what makes them. I said over here that positivism is split into two strands, individual and sociological. Individual positivism is also split into two, so you've got biological and psychological. This should all be pretty, you should all be pretty familiar with these ideas. What makes this approach positivistic in nature? What makes it positivism? What is positivism? Say it again. Right, okay, you've got a couple of things there. What's the first thing you said? I'm just going to write these over here because we'll come back to it. First thing, it's based on treatment. And the other thing you said was? Right, brilliant, okay. I know from those two statements that you just made to me, one, that you've read um, already, you've done some background reading, and two, you're going to do very well in the module. So well done. Okay, right. I'm going to come back to these, okay, because that's, you're, you're about five minutes ahead of where I want to be right now. The different, the essentially, positivistic approaches are based upon what's called a scientific method. Yeah, it's the ba it's, it's based upon the notion that you apply the method of the natural sciences to understanding human action. So it's scientific in approach. Right. Let me explain why positivism is a method and why it's scientific. Okay. 
I'll give by way of an example. Okay. Um, that looks a bit rude, doesn't it? The room. Right. If that's a Bunsen burner. <laughs> That's a Bunsen burner. That's a flame. That's that's you've got filthy light. This is a little bowl of water. If I heat that water, what's going to happen? It's going to boil. Eventually, we can get two elements from this: two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, H2O. Okay. Now. That is a scientific experiment. Now, the positivists believe that we can use this method of the natural sciences, so biology, um, physics, and what's the other one? That's the one, chemistry, as you can see. Um, we could use the method of that and apply it to humans. Right, that's interesting. So what do they mean by that then? Well, what they meant by that was that when we conduct a, an experiment. If I was to do that again, what would happen? The same thing. You can repeat it and it's predictable. And they're saying that if we treat social facts as things, then we can look at human action in the same way. We can look at society objectively. All we need to do is work out what these facts are and what they actually mean. So, it's the application of this method Okay, that's the key word, method. Of this method to study in humans. So let me give you an example of sociological positivism there. Right, you're all going to be leaving here. What time is the seminars? It's four to six, isn't it? You're all going to leave here at six o'clock. Okay? Now I'm not a scientist, but I can make a number of predictions in the same way that a scientist can. So, where else do you live in London? East London, okay, I can predict that when you leave here, you're probably going to be getting on public transport, and I predict that whatever form of public transport you get on, whether or not it's a bus or whether it's a tube, okay, you're probably going to have somebody's armpit shoved in your face. You're going to be stuck in rush hour traffic, okay, and tomorrow, if you leave university at the same time, you'll also get stuck in rush hour traffic. That's a prediction that I can make, okay, based upon observable phenomena. Okay? So we can use this scientific method to make certain observations. And all we need to do is to understand these facts and treat them as though they're things and examine them scientifically. Okay? Now the point is the following. Now let's try to put this on a, on a kind of a chart to to look at the dichotomies, look at the differences between these, because we still need to get to this. This is where we're going to, okay? I want to show you why these approaches are what we call orthodox, okay? Why they're conventional criminology, what makes them conventional? Because obviously what we're going to be looking at today and for the rest of the module is going to be a departure from these um, conventional methods or from these um, traditional methods of understanding uh, crime, causality, and all that sort of stuff. Right, so let's look at this in terms of a chart. So let's put some different colours. Right, so we'll have classicism here and positivism here. Let's look at the, the differences. And this is where we're going to get, okay? I'm going to show you why we call these approaches orthodox or conventional crime. Firstly, one of the dichotomies is this is that classicism is in fact a philosophy. Okay, it's a philosophy, whereas positivism is a method. Okay, so classicism is based upon these principles that we are endowed with the ability to make choices, and um, we can um, our actions can be manipulated based upon um, a variety of external factors. Whereas positivism is a method. What do classicists focus on? Well, classicists. The classicists, they focus upon the individual. Oh, sorry, they focus on the crime, sorry. They focus on the crime. Because of what crime has been committed, 
whereas the um, positivists, on the other hand, focus upon the criminal. Can you, can you see that? Can you see the differences? Do you want me to explain this? So basically, the classicists say, well, what crime has been committed um, sort of focuses on um, the actual crime itself as opposed to the positivists are looking at the causes of crime within the criminal themselves. The classicists uh, use legal definitions of what crime is, whereas, on the other hand, the positivists use social definitions of crime. Okay? Right, but this is the, the key point. Now we're getting to the point I'm trying to make to you about um, why these forms of criminal criminology are orthodoxy. What do they advocate in terms of what ought to be done about crime? What do, what's the policy that flows from this? What do the classicists believe we ought to do in order to deal with criminality? What do they argue we ought to do? What should we do in order to address the problem of crime? What do they recommend? What's the policy? Punishment. Punishment, okay, yes, good. Punishment. They believe that we should have a reformed legal system. So they wanted to reform the old systems that were seen as being barbaric, inefficient, so the old kind of uh, public executions, capital uh, and cultural forms of punishment. And they wanted to see the introduction of new carceral forms of punishment. So moving away from punishing people's bodies to punishing people's, or disciplining people's minds. Okay? What policy flowed from the positivists? What did they believe we ought to do? Yes. Treatment for the individual. Because you would either treat the individual or you would treat the social causes, wouldn't you, that are external to the individual. Okay? Right. So you're five minutes ahead of me, right? Right, okay, so we've still not established why these approaches are orthodox in nature. What makes them orthodox? Well, there were a number of assumptions that both of these approaches have made. And when I've been talking about them, I've been framing the questions in a way that suits the classicist and the positivist agenda. Because both classicism and positivism focus on this. This is what makes them orthodox. They seek to control crime. Okay? They both want to, in different ways, they go back in different ways, want to reveal the causes of crime. Okay? But they want to control crime. They see crime as something that ought to be controlled. You're sitting there thinking, well, you're, you're just a frown, brow on, your, on yourself there, you're like, well, how does that make it orthodox then? Well, I'll tell you how it makes it orthodox. The classicists believe, let's the classicists, let's the book. The classicists believe that in order to control crime, we do what then? We reform the old legal system, make it more certain, make it more reason, make it more rational. This will deter individuals from committing crime. Okay? That's how we can control crime. Positivists, how do we control crime? Well, we can, if we can identify a defective gene, biological positivism, or a defective experience, psychological positivism, then we can treat that stimuli, treat that, that, term, that factor, if you like. If it's something to do with um, some sociological factor outside or external to the individual, then we need to um, do some social engineering in order to address that. Okay? But they both want to control crime. And the other thing, well, yeah, obviously that's what they want to do, they don't want to control crime. What's so wrong with that? Okay? Well, we'll see why that's problematic in a moment. Control crime. Who's doing the controlling of crime in both of those instances? Who's doing the controlling? People of power. Hmm? People of power. 
he can power. Okay, yes. Any other ideas? I mean, you're, you're already thinking like a critical criminologist because you're using that term. You know that the radical critique is, is, is one about power and equality. Who is bringing about these control mechanisms? Who is reforming the state? Who is carrying out research into defective genes? Who's doing that? Who's funding that? But it's this. It's the state. And obviously, you're right to say it's powerful, but that's obviously a value judgment, and you need to show that it's the powerful. But that, that in itself is a, is a, a radical observation, is a radical critique. But it's the state. It's the state that is endowed with um, the responsibility of controlling crime. Um, I've used this example before, my timeline, where you've got the Industrial Revolution, okay, and this brings about what I call a fundamental transformation in the nature of social relations. Okay, it's on the recording. Fundamental transformation. Everything happens, okay, everything changes as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. But what happened during this period was the, the character and the nature of the state changed. The Industrial Revolution, it brought about a range of new challenges, okay? Let's think about this. You're living pre-Industrial Revolution, rural communities. That all changes. So you go from all rural living arrangements to urban living arrangements. This creates a whole range of new, different challenges, okay? Imagine what it's like. In a rural community, Industrial Revolution, you're living on your nice little homestead with all the other members of your family and an extended family. You pretty much know all of your neighbours. If you don't know them, you're also probably um, related to quite a few of them at the same time, okay? Very, very kind of insult, very self-sufficient. Anything you want, you could probably get um, in your local community. Whereas the Industrial Revolution brings about a huge marked division of labour. So you go from these small kind of informal um, communities to the, to the metropolis, to the city. And they're scary places. The, the new metropolis, the new city, brings about a whole range of new challenges. Disease, squalor. What's the other big one? Poverty and... What are we studying here? Crime. Okay. So modernity brings about a number of big challenges. I've used this example before. Famously, Parliament wouldn't, couldn't sit one summer because of the stench of the River Thames. The River Thames is right outside, um, right alongside the House of Parliament. And the, the stench coming from the river, because there's no sanitation, there's literally rivers of piss and shit everywhere. You've got horses, horse manure everywhere. People are literally pissing in buckets and throwing it out the windows. Um, so there's no sanitation. The, the, the piss and the shit is running into the water, into the water network, and people are dying as a consequence of they're getting all of these various diseases. So you've got disease, unemployment, huge amounts of poverty and crime. Right, this is the important thing. This. You've got all these problems, okay? And it's the first time people start talking about, and you've heard this expression, the system. People start talking about the system. We have these problems. And it was increasingly believed by people that someone should do something about it. Who was the someone that was to do something about it? It was the state. It was the state. People were looking towards the state to do something about these new problems. So, what did the state do? The state created a number of institutions. It used bureaucracy in order to deal with these problems. So you have new institutions being born. Things like the medical profession to deal with disease. Things like uh, the poor laws being introduced and, and being uh, kind of improved and still needed a long way to go. But in order to deal with issues of poverty, you had the police as an institution being created in order to deal with the problem of crime. You had things, um, uh, institutions being created in order to build networks of sewers 
And it was the state that was doing it. So, people have gone from these rural communities, where everyone knows everyone, to the city. And they're scary places. You don't know anyone, there's lots of crime, there's lots of deviancy, there's lots of poverty, they're not very nice places to be. There's lots of stories when you look at um, crime in the London underworld, of people not being able to walk down the street at night time for fear of being, um, being coshed on the head or being garroted. That's where somebody puts a, a wire around your neck and kind of throttles you and then says, give us your money, otherwise we'll kill you. The London was a scary place, not just London, but other urban environments. And people begin to look towards the state in order to address these problems. And this is where you begin to get the emergence of these classicist ideas. The old system doesn't work. We need to reform it. The old system of hanging people in the streets doesn't work. The old system of periods didn't work. We need to have this new rational form of punishment called prisons. These prisons, there are more reasoned, rational, civilised, uh, form of punishment. Okay? Alongside this, you had the other arguments of the positivists who are saying, well, no, I'm going to do it. Um, we can see an outward sign of these inward criminal, um, in, in, inborn criminal nature. So, what we need to do is we need to work out using science how criminals are somehow different. We need to carry out scientific research, and that's where you get things like Lombroso talking about extra fingers and nipples and stuff like that. But importantly, it's orthodox because these are state sponsors respond of state sponsored responses to the problem of crime. Okay? So the concept of crime, and this is important, the concept of crime itself is not seen as being problematic, it's just there. It's a shoe. Okay? Right. Is that making some sense there? Can you see how these approaches the old classes and positive approach are seen as being orthodox. Hopefully you can. If not, go back over this video, okay? Do the readings that I flagged up to you and it'll all pretty much make sense. Right, so that's where we are with that then. We're saying then that these old approaches are kind of state um, sponsored, if you like, um, orthodox classical um, approaches to uh, crime. So what is it that the radical criminologists are actually saying there? Okay, let's look at this a bit more detail then. So I've got up here, let's go back to what we said here. These approaches are a critique then, a critique of these orthodox approaches. So what is it they actually do then? Well, there's three things. Three things that lay at the heart of this critique, of these radical approaches. And as I said, what this is, is an umbrella term. Okay, that's an umbrella. Okay? There, are, there are, are, are a range of voices or a range of approaches that fall under this general banner of radical criminology. So what unifies them? Okay, well firstly, this is one of the unifying factors. The first thing is that these approaches have no, have no standard definition. There is no standard definition. I'm going to go on to look at this in a bit more detail again, but there is no standard de definition of what a radical approach is. So no definition. Okay? So the term itself, what we're actually looking at in this module, the term itself is actually contested. It's contested. So what we mean by radical approach is in itself up for debate. Well, that doesn't help us. Certainly the origins of this are, are contested. There's several strands. The second key thing is that these different strands, in one way or another, provide a critique of mainstream criminology, or orthodox criminology is the term I've been using as well. So mainstream or orthodox criminology is, for all intents and purposes, today being used interchangeably. So it's a critique of classicism, and positivism. Okay? Now this is the most important part. Thirdly, this is the other unifying factor between all of the approaches we're going to go on to look at. So the starting point is that crime and deviancy are both socially constructed. Socially constructed. Crime and deviancy is socially constructed. Now, what does that mean then? 
where they say that crime has, has no inherent quality. There's no inherent quality to a criminal act. Let me give you an example. If I go over to my rucksack now and pull out a needle and roll up my sleeve and inject myself with morphine, is that a crime? It's deviant, but it's not a crime. Why is it not a crime? It's de it is deviant because you didn't deviate to the norm. Is that a crime? Who believes that's a crime? If I start injecting myself with morphine. See it sometimes in so, you see it all around the country, don't you? See the needles. Well, ordinarily people can say, yes, if I start injecting myself with heroin, then that is a crime. Okay? However, according to this approach, social constructionism, constructivism, no act is inherently criminal or inherently deviant. And it's an example that can be used by the symbolic interactors. We'll look at this in greater detail next week. The act of actually injecting heroin in itself is not deviant. Because you don't know, I may have some um, chronic disease where uh, I'm in an awful lot of pain and I have to inject myself with morphine in order to, and that is the same as heroin, it's the same thing, in order to um, address that pain. In which case it becomes legal if a nurse injects me with morphine. Um, it's legal. So it depends upon the construction. Right, so what they're saying then is that we ought to adopt what's called an anti-essentialist approach to understanding crime. Crime itself is something that needs to be examined. Crime has no ontological reality. Okay? It has no ontological reality. It has no meaning in itself. So, crime is constructed. And again, you know, I know this is a concept that you looked at last year in chronological imagination, so it's all here. Okay? But this is a, a refresher. It should be terms that you're unfamiliar with. So let's look at this in a bit more detail there. Right. So, no definition. Okay? The term itself is contested. Um, you would have read um, the first chapter of um, Ugly Deacon. You would have seen this quote by De Cassidy. De Cassidy says, The definition of critical criminology is subject to much debate, and there is no widely accepted precise formulation. That's okay, so on page 11 of that. Okay? So, what De Cassidy is basically saying there is that there is no standard definition, it's an umbrella term. But it encompasses a range of different voices. Okay? Things like xenology, things like the Frankfurt School, things like symbolic interactionists and the Birmingham School. Some of these things we're going to go on to look at in greater depth. Altusa, Foucault, people like this. Now, let's look at this in a, in a broader context then. The 1970s was a higher point of critical criminology. This is when these approaches really begin to start, uh, begin to take hold, where people start to um, adopt this much more critical approach to understanding this topic that we call crime. Okay? Now, the origins of critical criminology can focus on three different things, okay, in addition to this. Okay? So the first is the gender tends to play a central role in these approaches, considerations. Racial, number two, racial inequality. Racial inequality, or race, is a factor. And thirdly, inequality in terms of social order. Okay, whether you want to call that class, or however that might manifest itself. Right, we're getting a flavour now for what this approach is trying to do then. Now, in the 1960s, the decade before this, this is when, this is kind of you know, the, the birthplace of this study. Um, you have people um, in the institutions, mainly in England, really, 
um, that we're beginning to question social arrangement, we're beginning to question these orthodox approaches. Okay? I'll tell you, uh, 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 actually no, I'll tell you a story. Um, right, so, the, the two key drivers to this approach in the 1960s and 1970s were Marxism and interactionism. Now next week we're going to be looking at interactionism in a lot more detail. Okay? But hopefully now you're a bit clearer as to the contrasting orientations. Now, I know that I'm asking you to understand something that at the moment is quite abstract. So next week, we're going to look at a much more concrete example of the type of approach um, that these um, approaches take, and what it is they actually say. Okay? So, we said that this approach there is based upon a number of different unifying factors. That is one word that I haven't rubbed off on this book right from the very beginning. Okay? And that word is critique. And in the same way, for the same reason that I've left that on the board, what you need to bear in mind is that this is a central theme throughout the entire module, that of critique. Okay? And that's what I want you to get from today's session, okay? is that the, the ideas that we're going to go on to look at have um, a direct relationship with critique. Culturally working, critique, critique. Um, having read lots of essays over the years, students tend to think that um, an evaluation is just a critique. Okay? Well, critique is more than just an evaluation. It's, it's about looking at the, the strengths and the weaknesses of a position. Okay? It's not just kind of providing criticisms, it's, it's, it's more than that. So, what was the first question that I asked you um, when we came in today's session? The first question was... Right, what do you think the two features of this critique are then? They are inequality and power relations. Power relations. So everything that we go on to look at will have at their core this critique, which is based upon inequality and power relations. Okay, right, so let's just kind of signpost where we're going next week. Next week we're going to be looking at one of the founding principles, or one of the founding schools of this critical approach, okay? And it's called symbolic interactionism, or Lady perspective. Now, uh, most of you that did some reading for today's session, much of what I ever said to you, hopefully, would have made some sense. And indeed, I'm hoping that even if there were one or two ideas that you weren't too sure about, now you've done that reading in advance, it kind of makes a bit more sense. That's good. So, keep that momentum going. Next week, do the reading in advance of the lecture on Lady Perspectives, and I guarantee you it will start to make sense. The Panotto videos, access them, okay? I'm not just doing this for the sake of it. Um, some of you will be sitting there thinking, oh, I didn't get that bit, I didn't get that bit. Go back onto the Panotto and you'll see it it's there. Okay, hold on, I'm finished. I'm finished. Whoa, 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 stop. I think you, you guys said it's going to come into the menu no more. <laughs> stop packing your pencils away. We're packing pencils, stop packing your pencils together. Hold on. Right. I should have mentioned this last week, okay, let me mention it this week. You know that I use abbreviations, okay? You know now that I do silly drawings. You know that I use abbreviations and silly drawings. When you look at your pad now, it might make perfect sense to you now, but in about five weeks' time when you have to start doing your essay, you'll look at it and go, what the hell? Why am I going to bump some going on here for? Why the hell is there a bunch of going on there? Right. It's a serious point. It's a serious point. Write up your notes from today's session by looking at the Panopto as well. Write them up. If you write them up, hold on. If you write them up, you'll be consolidating your understanding. And I guarantee you, it will help you considerably. So don't just put this in your file and think and forget about it. Think about it. 
okay? Write them up in some longhand in a way that you can understand them. It will help. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.